Welcome. Please stand. Sing with us. Continue to transform us and this world into a place of hope, hope for all, through the life and the death and the resurrection of our Christ who has come to us. Amen.
welcome this morning in Christ's name, but it's not warm in here. I don't know, if, maybe it's the, the substitute pastor's job to turn on the heat, I'm not sure. But you can sit if you like. Um, it's good to have you all here. Um, I was an associate pastor for six years when I first got out of seminary, and it was always the associate's pastor, pastor's job to preach every Sunday after Christmas and after Easter. And I'm back to it now, uh, which is just fine, and I reminded people then, and now I am of the same conviction that it's the real Christians who come the week after the holidays. So thanks for being here. I know it's a short night, not a happy night, I get all that, but, but God still came, right, uh, despite the Buckeyes performance. Um, I don't think there's anything else I need to say except uh, I have not done this service with you all before, so we'll get through it, and probably this morning, just okay is okay. <laughs> let's, let's continue to sing.
We got a few. Come on up. Since there's only three of you, four of you, I won't, won't go really, really long. Just about 15, 20 minutes. Is that all right? What do you guys, you guys usually sit down up here? Where does Pastor, what does Pastor Carl do? Does he stand? Does he sit? He stands. He stands like this? Did you, did you think maybe I was Pastor Carl because we have the same haircut? So, uh, we just celebrated Christmas, right? You guys got gifts and all that stuff, which is pretty exciting. But what's really important about Christmas? Only two of you know the answer. Three. Maybe. What do you think? Um, Jesus. Yeah, Jesus, right? Why did Jesus come? Because he was tired of living in heaven or what? The sick us. You know, I remember when I was, when I was a little kid, we'd, we'd drive somewhere and I'd be in the car with my mom and dad and sisters. And we'd come home, coming home late at night. And, and I'm thinking, uh, just about your guys' age, I'm thinking, I probably need to stay awake to make sure my dad doesn't fall asleep when we're driving home so we're safe, right? But I couldn't. I'd fall asleep in the car. You know how I was able to fall asleep in the car? Because I trusted my dad. I trusted my dad, my mom, that they'd, they'd be keeping me safe. You ever have that feeling? Is Mom and dad are pretty trustworthy, mostly, right? I mean, they're not perfect. No moms and dads are, right? They're going to make mistakes. They'll do some things wrong sometimes. Maybe not your parents. Maybe. But they love you, and you trust them with your love. Right? I think that same idea is why God came to be with us. So we can learn to trust our whole lives to God. God didn't come just to watch us, to keep us in line like some elf on a shelf or Santa Claus, you know, watching if we're good or bad. God came in Jesus to be with us, to love us, and so when we trust that God loves us and is with us, we don't have to worry about anything, do we? Nothing. We don't got to worry. Do we have to worry? No, we don't have to worry. God's going to take care of us. That's why God came. So we would get that message loud and clear. We got no worries. God's going to take care of us. God wants to be with us. God wants us to be with God in this life and then all for eternity, which is a pretty long time. Right? You got anything to worry about? Nada. Zippo. No. Right? Nothing. Okay. All right. Thanks. You may go back to your parents who you can trust. Mostly. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Reading is from Matthew 2, 13 through 23. Now after they had left, <clears throat> an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation. Rachel, weeping for her children, she refused to be consoled, because they are no more. When Herod died, 
An angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judah in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Some of you are uh, of the age where you remember better than the rest of us who are not quite of the age, but every parent has experienced and maybe can remember those, those nights that were way too short on sleep and too long on the baby's fate and wakefulness, right? Maybe they're stuffed up, maybe they're teething, maybe they're throwing up, or they just, maybe they're punishing their parents for casting them out of a nice warm cozy womb, I don't know. But every parent can remember the utter frustration of, of this crying that just won't stop. At one moment you ache for the child, and at another moment you think, maybe, it's, maybe I can return this child for another model. But more seriously, every parent has moments of, of a deeper, more profound sleeplessness. That comes when you look at this child and you wonder how life will unfold for him or her. Especially in a world that seems broken and laced with evil. Which one of us hasn't lain awake at night and thought about how complicated life has become? How many competing claims there are for loyalty that our children and grandchildren will face? How how they will manage to negotiate the losses that are part and parcel of living, how, how you'd love to protect them from the pain that they will surely encounter. Even those of us who carry with us this confidence that God loves us and is present in all times and places, we can't help but be concerned about the children. And What if our children don't develop that same kind of confidence in God? What if they don't grasp this essential trust that the universe is a good place? How will they manage? So, imagine what it must have been like for Mary and Joseph in those dark days of Palestine. Jesus born into an occupied country where Romans played fast and loose with the lives of the Jewish peasants like them. Imagine what it must have been like to live under that despot, Herod, who thought nothing of killing his rivals to power, even his own sons he killed, so he could stay in control. And then, and then when Joseph got the word that Herod was going to slaughter all the baby boys under two, rather than risk his power and control, even to an infant. Joseph believed what he heard from the angel, his vision, his dream, and he whisked the child out of harm's way. And so Mary and Joseph braved crossing a large, inhospitable dev desert to find safety. So desperate were they for the well-being of and life of their little one. Most of us probably have never really stopped to consider that Jesus and his family were refugees. They fled their war-torn home under the political pressure of persecution. It's a, it's a scenario that's been played out all through human history, not just in Jesus' day, but before and after and obviously in our own day. 
Imagine the sleepless nights parents have in, in Syria or, or in Haiti, in the, in the barrios of Mexico City or Guatemala or, or even on Columbus East Side. Most of those parents simply want their children to grow up in safety and security. And I assure you, I'm not advocating a, uh, this morning for a political uh, stance or solution to our immigration issues in this country or around the world. It's very complicated. I know that. But that Jesus and his family were refugees from a tyrant and desperate economic and political conditions that invites us at least to look at the current situation from a particular perspective. One of the things we often fail to understand is that the life of Jesus was far more political than we've been taught to think. We hear the Christmas carols, we love the Christmas carols, but they think that they present a Jesus meek and mild, a baby in a manger. But isn't it reasonable to assume that Jesus' life and ministry was shaped by the time into which he was born? Jesus was part of a people living under persecution. They were not at home in their own land. They had no political power. They were at the mercy of the Romans in every way. And into that setting, this baby boy grew up. And what he proclaimed was the kingdom of God. Not the kingdom of Herod, not the kingdom of, of Julius Caesar, Caesar Augustus. He proclaimed in that particular setting the kingdom of God, the reign of God. He said and he demonstrated over and over again that the kingdom of God, that God had come in him, with him, through him. He came to establish a new order in the world. And what Jesus proclaimed was so threatening to the order of power and authority in that world that it had to eliminate him. So the powers of Rome tried twice. Once they missed him as he fled to Egypt. The other time they got him, or so they thought. The story of Herod employing brutal extremes to protect his authority. We only read this lesson the year of Matthew when it comes around. So every three years, and only on the Sunday after Christmas. But this snapshot is, is about Herod employing brutal extremes to protect his authority. And it's what gives parents sleepless nights, isn't it? We know, all of us do, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that, that there is evil in the world, that it infects, at least to some degree, all who wield power. Back in the 19th century, when Lord Acton said, power tends to corrupt, Absolute power corrupts absolutely. He expressed what keeps us awake at night when we've brought children into the world. What we fret over when we look at the world around us, there is no politician, there is no political party, foreign or domestic, there is no military leader, there is no corporate, corporate mogul, there is not even a church official, not infected somehow by the presence and seductive nature of power. And it was into a world, in that respect, no different from ours, that Jesus was born. And Jesus' life and ministry was over and over again to invite human beings to live with and from a different authority and power. Jesus promoted the authority of God, and in Jesus that authority looked exactly like humble, gracious love. I think this, this awful, this terrible little story from Matthew about Herod's desperate attempt to keep power, the Holy Family's desperate attempt to escape that power, that has everything to do with how Jesus' life and ministry took shape. Surely his parents told Jesus of their narrow escape from Herod, as well as the slaughter of so many innocent children who were unable to flee. We see that his concern throughout life was to offer welcome and care to those who were always on the outside looking in. 
because he had been on the outside and he had been rescued. And so he embraced those who needed rescue. Lepers who, who weren't allowed for both religious and health reasons to, to be part of the community. Women in his entourage, which was not the norm for traveling rabbis in those days. He spoke to, he healed, he included Gentiles, believed by most Jewish people to be outside the concern of God. He practiced a radical humility and forgiveness, refusing to use even his own relationship with God to any advantage. He rarely seems to have taken offense when confronted by others or when spoken to unkindly or with suspicion. So is it unreasonable for those of us who pay attention to the scriptures, who believe Jesus is nothing less than God in the flesh, that Jesus' agenda for the world to usher in this kingdom of God, this reign of God, is it unreasonable to suggest that that also is our agenda? That Jesus' concern for the outsider, for the disenfranchised, for the refugee also ought to be our concern. That our call as followers of this child, this Prince of Peace, is to help fashion structures in the world and to reshape it into a world where there is enough for all, where there is safety for all, where there is hope for all as we come to every new year. And doesn't it seem reasonable that it begin with you and me on a personal level? See, how we spend our money, how we use our time, our energies, all that impacts how the world works, not only for us, but for others as well. I don't believe we are powerless pawns in the machine of the world. The way we treat our neighbors, near and far, the ways we call to account our political leaders, the ways we invest ourselves in life, all those things make a difference. And they might make a real difference to those whose lives are broken. Mahatma Gandhi, a Buddhist who by all accounts understood the message of, and life of Jesus better than most of us Christians, he said, be the change you wish to see in the world. Be the change you wish to see in the world. So as we begin a new year, maybe our best resolution might be to look at our own small lives and wonder how Jesus might be calling us to bring to reality God's reign. How might I reshape my living in order to bring hope and wholeness to someone who has little hope or wholeness? I, who trust fully that I'm beloved by God and that Jesus' love is, is wide open for all, how might I live in ways that bless the lives of those who've experienced few blessings? How, how might you and I, how might you and I live lives more full of care for others, that there are fewer parents who know sleepless nights? We will receive your gifts and your offerings as we sing the first Noel.
If you would, please stand for our prayers. Oh, gracious God, we are so grateful that you have come to be in this world, that you have come to us to let us know that your desire more than anything else in all this universe is to be present and to provide us with courage and hope and not just us Lord God but all and so as we give thanks for that gracefulness that we have experienced in our lives we we ask that we would be humble enough that we would allow your gracefulness to transform our lives that we can offer that same grace and goodness and confidence to those around us those we know those we don't know those who are afraid those who live in darkness somehow oh Lord God we are asking that you would make us and our spirits and our lives available to others we especially think in this holy season of refugees those who are desperate those who have fled desperate situations who have risked their lives for the sake of hope and wholeness somehow in the midst of such complicated and difficult issues Lord God we pray for grace and mercy for all those who are desperate and those who are somehow addressing that desperation and we pray for your presence in our lives for hope and wholeness when people who are ill suffer around us we pray oh Lord God for Kimberly and Meg and Susan and Lauren Holly Julie Jennifer Susie Sally Taylor Terry Susan Janet Julie Dale Ralph Amanda Egon Sue Margaret Mary we pray your presence for Paul and Andrew and Nathan and for those who we name either aloud or silently in our hearts even as we pray for others Lord God we do so with the awareness that it may be any of us that you use to provide healing and wholeness and hope so prepare us for that as we leave this place today we pray these prayers and all of our prayers in the name and for the sake of Christ our Lord Amen. we come to the meal why do we do this every week it's not much bread it's not much wine it's... but it's God's desire to be present to us for us in us and to remind us that we are healed and made whole by this presence of God and we are nourished by this presence and sent into the world with this presence so we remember we remember when Jesus gathered his disciples and he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take eat this is my body given for you do this for the remembrance of me And after supper he took the cup once again gave thanks gave it to them saying take drink all of you this is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin do this for the remembrance of me and he taught us to pray together our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. This is the meal in which we celebrate that mystery. Come and eat.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Lord God, you have once again gathered us. You have reminded us. You have strengthened us. But it's not just for us. We know that, Lord God. It is for the world. So send us with that courage and that reminder and that strength, that humble authority for the world to make lives different, to make the world different for the sake of Christ our Lord. Amen. Announcements. So you all know what's going on. I don't. <laughs> uh, Pastor Carl did say to let you know that the office will be closed until Thursday. So anything you need needs to wait till then, I guess. Uh, so, and uh, also a reminder from older guild folks, uh, if you've, uh, some of these poinsettias are yours that, that you purchased, take them home. They probably won't get much attention over the next few days. So uh, anything else need to be shared that you all know? Okay, if not, then if you would stand for our benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Peace. Serve the Lord.